the kind of brand damage that can come from people losing faith, losing trust, losing a fealty to your brand is something that no regulatory fine could ever come close to replicating. Welcome to one of the most important podcast series I've ever been associated with. Never the same business after the Ukraine war. In this five-part podcast series, along with my co-host Brandon Daniels, we explore how currents which have been percolating since at least the onset of the pandemic in 2020 came to fruition in February of 2022 when Russia invaded. In the five topics of supply chain, sanctions and AML, corruption as a national security issue, cybersecurity, and ESG, we will explore how businesses have changed literally forever with the advent of the conflict in Ukraine. These strains did not come out of nowhere. They have been in business bubbling up over the past two to three years, perhaps even longer. But now, compliance officers, business executives, legal eagles, and the government needs to understand that business has changed forever. And we're going to explore that in this podcast series. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back again with Brandon Daniels, CEO at Exeger Inc. for our concluding episode of our five-part series on Never the Same, How the Business World Changed after the Ukraine invasion. Brandon, first of all, welcome back. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me. Brandon, once again, our topic today is something that has been percolating for quite some time. It increased during the, sped up during the pandemic and is now one of the most ubiquitous terms in business, which is ESG. But I think some significant changes have come to ESG from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and indeed ESG will never be the same, and it will never impact companies less going forward. But uh, from where you sit, how do you see the impact of ESG on companies having changed from the Russian invasion? I think ESG, as you mentioned, prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, prior to the war that has been carried out by the Russian autocracy on the sovereignty of democracy, ESG was amorphous, meaning it meant different things to different companies. Like at some companies that would focus on the G and they'd almost exclusively focus on things like cyber governance. Am I managing my risk register effectively? I had people that would ask me about ESG and it would be all about DE&I, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in some cases, they might even include sort of best practices in labor management and stamping out modern slavery. And yet another cohort of customers would look at ESG and they would talk about nothing but environmental risk issues. Very few clients that I've spoken to have thought holistically about how their brand is impacted by all three of those areas, environmental, social, and governance problems, until the Russia war against Ukraine. Until this war broke out, people hadn't put together those three as a comprehensive assessment. And the fact that so many companies were hit so hard by the disruption of the Russian supply chain set a blinding lights in front of most corporate risk managers across our U.S. and allied partner industrial base. Because what it did was it flagged for you that, hey, a huge volume of your aluminum is coming from Russia. A huge volume of your neon is coming from smelters in Ukraine. A large volume of companies had spread to Russia and had coupled with some characters that supported Putin's regime pretty closely. And so you had these existential shifts in ESG where people were confronted with the fact that, oh, we're way too reliant on fossil fuels coming from Russia. 
which was the e-issue, right? There weren't strict trade regulations. We were largely still dependent on Russian gas in Europe. And being confronted with that issue made people think, well, what kind of concern does this create for me, not just in terms of supply disruption, but reputational brand damage? In terms of social issues, again, companies were forced to first say, well, let me comply with sanctions. But then a bunch of companies, there were boycotts against companies that maintained relationships with the Russian autocracy, right? I mean, there were boycotts against companies that had ties to Russian oligarchs. There were companies that extracted themselves altogether from Russia. Exiger took a really sort of strict stance on this, Tom, and just said, you know, we're not doing due diligence or not providing our services or our technology to any companies that support any of these Russian interests. Look at the S side of ESG way beyond compliance. They decided to protect reputational brand, and that's going to have a lasting impact on how people think about ESG and ESG scoring and ESG resilience and ESG prioritization. The last thing is in terms of board governance and in terms of governance overall, how do you systemically prepare for and then actually act in the case of a crisis? I think a lot of companies were caught flat-footed. Again, looking across the three pillars of ESG, I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine forced us to, one, take ESG more seriously than I think people had previously. Two, I think it codified and solidified in people's minds the need to manage ESG as a part of reputational brand value. And then lastly, I think it really put a fine point on the idea that you have to look at ESG proactively because trying to react to these situations causes so much turmoil that it's not tolerable in a traditional corporate risk management framework. Reputational risks and damage that you articulated in the prior answer really spoke to or raised a question with me about has potential reputational damage become more significant than potential regulatory damage? So in an earlier podcast, we talked about economic sanctions, trade compliance, And if a company might violate those, what some of the regulatory sanctions might be. But my question is, if they engage in that type of behavior, if they continue to do business in Russia, would the potential reputational damage be even greater and the financial loss be greater? It's certainly greater than it's ever been. Meaning regulators can impose big fines to the tune of billions of dollars. We've seen that. As we saw in the financial crisis, the fines reached unbelievable levels. But the reputational damage, the brand damage that has come out of the Russian-Ukraine war hurts your top-line revenue. So whereas fines and regulatory issues can drain cash, your market cap, your valuation as a business, all that is traditionally driven off of revenue. And the impact that the Russian invasion of Ukraine had on companies because companies had ties to this brutal regime could be in the billions of dollars in just revenue, but then could also be a lasting value and what's more purpose driven what is more purpose driven than supporting democracy and supporting the arrest the fight against a brutal regime that is quite literally killing innocent women and children this isn't a question of risk management or risk appetite tom this is a question of deciding whether or not you as a brand have a brand that can stand for the ideals of freedom and the ideals that we have for an inclusive and fair and open 
and democratic world. And so when we talk about purpose driven, we have to remember that what people are demanding is a company that aligns with their values, aligns with their ethics. And again, the kind of brand damage that can come from people losing faith, losing trust, losing a fealty to your brand is something that no regulatory fine could ever come close to replicating. Brandon, I can't really think of a better way to end this series. We started off talking about how the Ukraine war had driven regulatory change and business risk change. We pivoted to how companies might think through managing these changes and using these as a business positive going forward. And now we've tied it back to what I think is the most important theme of this podcast series, which is the fight for democracy. And that businesses have a place in this fight and doing business in a manner that's purpose-driven with a framework that people can agree on with a way we can measure and test against that framework to see how we're doing really is, in my mind, a great way to end this series and to hope people will understand the things not only they now face, but perhaps how they can meet those challenges going down the road. Absolutely. Completely agree. We're in a market. We're in a global corporate ecosystem that is changing for the better. We're making the world a safer place to do business. And I think that ultimately, despite some pain, despite the volatility, at the end of the day, our goal is to provide sustainable growth that's fair, just, and provides opportunity for individuals to thrive. And there's no way to do that without having risk management, strong governance, and the ability to sometimes put our ethics above profits. So, Tom, thank you for this entire conversation, and thank you for continuing to highlight how critical it is that we get this entire complex framework of risk management right for generations to come. This is Tom Fox. Thank you for listening to this episode of Never the Same business after the Ukraine war. This podcast was produced by One Stone Creative, and I want to give a shout out to Megan Doherty, Audra Casano, Darla Field, and the entire team at One Stone Creative. If you are interested in podcasting and need some help, or you want to have a turnkey solution, my suggestion is you would contact One Stone Creative. We're going to link to them in the show notes. On a very personal note, I hope that this podcast series will get you to think and be curious and look at all of the issues we have explored in this podcast series. I really believe we have had a true watershed moment, and I think those who don't understand that will be left in the dust of 2022. This is Tom Fox. Thank you again for listening. Never the same business after the Ukraine war is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.